well, it's going by faster than I thought. Yeah. Celeste, put your name back in the chat because I just started recording. I want to make sure I capture everybody's name. So everybody put your name and campus in the chat. That'd be great. Hi, Tamara. Hello. Hi. Hi, Jasmine. Hi, iPhone 5. I don't know who you are yet. Donasia Morris. Okay. Everybody put their name and campus in the chat. That'd be fantastic. Hi, Donasia. Oh, I have an I. Oh, Emma. Emma. Hey, Emma. Hello. How are you? Jasmine, you there? Just waiting for others to join. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Leslie. Hello, how are you? I'm great, how are you? I'm good. Good. iPhone 5, Denasia, could you turn your camera on, please? Thank you. Hi, Kaisia. <coughs> Are you sick? Yes, I got a little cold. Do I have anybody? Pensacola, I have a bunch of Pensacola students. Did you guys survive the, what did you end up getting, rain? What'd you guys get? Yeah, what? Does that, anybody here from Pensacola yet? Where is everybody? is it oh my gosh it's already after 11 it's our, well it's already after one so with you guys i'm going to get started so i'm not sure where everybody is um jasmine can you turn your camera on please i need to see you jasmine not the ceiling Leslie, I need to see you as well. I need to see your faces. Thanks. Okay, so for everybody that is here, thank you for coming to class today on time. Looks like we are missing a ton of students. Um, anything going on that you guys know about? That we would have so many students not here. Anybody from Pensacola? Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, welcome. Guess what? We made it to week six. We're at the end of week six. We're halfway through. Can you believe it? Um, iPhone, uh, Denasia, I need to see you. There you are. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So we made it through week six. Um, next week's an exam. I just posted in your announcements before I started class, my exam review from this morning. I only had about six people and I don't think I had any of my students. So, um, and then I posted 
uh, Dr. Ford, Dr. Ford's um, review from Monday, she had nobody. Okay, so you should now have two recordings to listen to. Um, I highly encourage you to, if you can't attend a live, to listen to my review um, or Dr. Ford's. Dr. Kershaw has hers on Sunday night. So there's still one more opportunity to go to a live review. Uh, that is Sunday evening. Hey, Dinesh, I still can't see you. I'm just looking at the ceiling. Okay. Um, so anyway, that's it with reviews. How are you guys doing with your study guide? I'm gonna meet my... Has anybody taken had a chance to look at the study guide? Um, I'm not getting any, I, I don't know what's going on, but I'm, I'll double check, but I really haven't been, is, is it sent through the email or Canvas? Oh, it's in your announcements. Okay. I did I'll post it, right? I'll double yes, check. Yeah, I thought I'll I posted it. I'll double check and see. Yep. It was in your announcements and it was probably early in the week. I think I got it out maybe Sunday or Monday. Okay, I'll double check yep. in um, right now while you... Um... Okay, and then, like I said, I would encourage you to go through the recording that I just sent because I went through the study guide with the six students that, um, six students that were there, um, and it will give you a good understanding of some test-taking strategies. Go, I didn't go through line by line the study guide, but went through how it was organized and... We went through some what if questions. Um, I think what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna try and um, lecture on content for a bit, and then we'll do, I think we have quiz four, right? Quiz three. We're still on three? Is it quiz four? I think it's four. Oh we'll yeah, quiz four. Okay, and then we'll do the quiz after I do the content, and then we'll have a quick look at the study guide. All right, but I won't do an in-depth study guide. I just wanna show it to you, kind of go through some test-taking strategies. Oh boy, it says my internet connection is unstable. Mm, I don't know why, it's beautiful here. So if I cut out, I'll be right back, but I shouldn't be having any internet issues. Um, okay. Um, so thanks for everybody for being on camera. I appreciate it. Danesha, I still can't see you. I'm looking at your ceiling. Um, there you are, kind of. Um, anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions about anything? I, I found it. Oh, you did. Good, good, good. Yeah. Good. Awesome. Wonderful, thank you. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. We're gonna go through a couple of things. Okay, you guys see my screen? Make sure everybody has their name and campus in the chat, please. Okay, so announcements I just posted. Um, to we got going. Here's a recording, it was just posted a few minutes ago. Tamara, so that's in your announcement, okay? So if you're looking for the record, everything's, my communication with you is through the announcements, okay? Here's Dr. Ford's review from earlier in the week. And then I sent you guys out uh, homework grades and mid-module assessments. So you know what that means, right? So it's the end of week six. So anybody that's below a 78, I have to do a mid-module assessment on. It's just an evaluation of the first six weeks. It's kind of like the at-risk reports, but it's, uh, composition of the first six weeks. So if you end up getting a mid-module assessment from me, um, we need to set up a time to meet to review that because I send a copy to you. Um, so if you get that, please reach out to me. And I'll, when I send that, I'll send a kind of a cover, cover some cover guidelines. Um, so let's see, that's the mid-mod. Now, everybody understands what it means when I say I've turned on homework grades, right? Could somebody please explain to me what that means? Does that mean that like the the your grades for the homework are turned on for right now, so you'll see what your overall um, K KGA that's is? Yep, right that's now. exactly right, Celeste. That's exactly right. So 
you know, I, I always say at the beginning, I'm really, I, I think I'm very good on staying on you guys for homework. I don't have a whole lot of homework issues in this class, but there are some students that have not turned on, uh, that have not submitted homework, and it's beyond the seven days, so they can't submit it. So they're going to have to work super hard with the rest of their homework. Remember, we're still in week six, so if you're missing something from week five, you can still turn it in for a 10% deduction, right? So when you look at your grade now, it's either going to be higher or lower than your KGA, right? Higher means you're submitting all your homework, you're doing great. If your homework grade is lower than your KGA, that means you're missing stuff, okay? So... Um, that's what that means. Okay. So I'll be turning it off at the end of next week, at the end of week seven, because uh, week eight is drop week. And so I want you to have a clear understanding of what your grade is without the homework turned on. Because we all know at the end of the at the end of the term, you have to have a 78 with your KGAs and your, your KGAs are your three exams and your five quizzes, right? So you know you have to have a 78% um, before your homework kicks in. Everybody knows that, right? Okay, so that's what was posted. So you've got your two recordings, okay? Your homework grades are on. Uh, oh, maybe that was it, Pensacola, that was it. <laughs> Pensacola student, Pensacola campus is recognizing Veterans Day. So their campus is closed. That's right. That's why all my Pensacola students are missing. Okay. So let's see. Welcome to who came on here? James, Dikshaya, Brittany. Hi, guys. If you could put your name and your campus in the chat, I would appreciate it. And then whatever you missed for the last 10 minutes, if you could just review the recording when I send it out. Okay. How's everybody coming on their um, group projects? They're due next week, next Wednesday. Next Wednesday, they're due in week seven, right? Yeah. How's everybody coming on them? You guys working on them? Oh, James, you're here from Pensacola. Hey, you guys have a recognized holiday, right? Yeah. Yeah, thanks for coming. How's the weather down there? Did you, was it just get a lot of rain? Uh, no, not really. No, you guys. It's sunny outside right now. God, great, great, great. Okay, um, Emma, I need to see you in your camera. Dikshaya, I need to see you in your camera iPhone 5, Denisha, I still can't see. Here's Emma. There's Brittany. Okay. Professor Marvel, I have a quick question. Um, sure. So when do we present the project in class? Yes. Oh, I asked, uh, when do we present the project? Oh, 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 sorry. Week eight. Week eight? Okay. Because yeah. I was like, we have an exam next week, so we wouldn't be able to. Nope. Okay. Okay. Um, hang on. Okay. Um, yeah, so you'll turn it in. Yeah, we'll do, uh, so a week from today, we'll be doing the exam. That's week seven. And then uh, two weeks from today, we'll be doing just a short, it's just a short presentation. The group um, does like a five minute summary of your paper. Okay. Okay, let's go ahead. Um, do we need to have a PowerPoint or can we just talk? No, it's a paper. It's not a PowerPoint. It's a paper. And what students have done in the past is they just pull up their paper on their computer. And as a group, they just give a summary. 
Oh, okay. Thank you. It's super easy. A couple of minutes. Just so that we can learn a little bit about the infectious disease that you guys are studying. All right, let's get to our content. Anybody know what we're covering today? Nobody knows what we're covering today? Okay. We're going over occupational and environmental health. Yeah, we're going over occupational environmental health. And we're also gonna cover um, part of chapter eight. Okay, a couple of pages in chapter eight, communication, the nurse -pati patient relationship, and then we're responsible for all of chapter nine. Okay, so um, let's see this week. So you have your NCLEX questions this week, our attestation, your attestation, which we'll do at the end of class, and then we'll do quiz four after we cover the content. Okay, next week is your exam week. Okay, but you also have your group project. And remember that initial group project is due Wednesday, right? Because you have to uh, do your peer, submit your peer responses by Sunday. All right, so next week has a Wednesday due date. All righty, and then our exam. Okay, so let's cover environmental and occupational health first since there are your teaching sheets in your, in your module. Let's cover that and then we'll see what we missed and we'll go through the notes. Okay, so what is occupational health? What's occupational health? Anybody know? It's all about the workplace. Okay, it's all about the workplace. Occupational environmental health nursing is responsible for health promotion, safety programs, services to workers, okay? Workers, worker populations, and community groups, all right? So what it focuses on is the promotion and restoration of health, okay? It also focuses on the prevention of illness and injury in the workplace. And it also focuses on work-related environmental hazards. Okay, so occupational health nurses have an extremely important role in their, in their, if they're, if that's their profession. They're responsible for knowing work sites in and out, who are their, who's their population, who's at risk for health issues, who's at risk for injury, what are the risks the workers face in that environment. Um, is it noise from larger plants? Is it uh, heat, cold exposure? Is it um, at risk for injury, lifting? So they need to know who their employees are, what their job descriptions are, what they're being asked to do. And they need to make sure that they have taught and educated empl uh, employees on the risks associated with their job. Right? There's no one occupation or, or place of employment that is not at risk for anything. And that's important to remember. So whether you're working at McDonald's or you're working at the football stadium or you're working in a large uh, manufacturing plant or you're working in an office building, there's risks associated with all work sites. Okay, nobody's immune to it. Okay, poor employee health costs businesses approximately $1 trillion annually. That's all that workers comp, okay? So, so administrators and companies look for occupational environmental nurses to help with maximizing um, employee productivity, okay? Trying to lower disability claims, have fewer on the job injuries, 
Okay. So what kinds of roles might an occupational or environmental nurse have? Well, certainly case management. Does everybody know what case, ma what's case management? Anybody know what case management is? Okay, you guys are working, go ahead. Um, I was gonna say like just managing, mm -hmm. well, each employee might have their own specific case. So managing, I guess the health of that particular employee. employee. Okay, so yes. So case man, that's part of it. Case management, really as a case manager, you're kind of the coordinator of care, okay? You're managing all different kinds of groups, okay? It may be a group of injured workers, okay? It may be a group that has diabetes that you're trying to help educate on how to take care of themselves better, okay? So case managers are, court, case management, case managers are coordinators of care. So if you have a work-related injury, there's lots of people that need to be involved, right? The doctor, maybe physical therapy, maybe the employer, human resources, um, therapy places where the person might be going. So that's part of the role of the uh, occupational nurses to case manage all these occurrences, whether they're injuries or, I don't know, leave of absences, discipline okay uh, they may also be a counselor and during crisis inter and crisis intervention okay think about it we spend about a third of our lives at work so people are going to bring their personal personal things to work they just are okay uh, workers maybe maybe have issues with substance abuse have psychological needs Maybe they have wellness concerns. Maybe they have chronic health issues, okay? So they take a big role on for counseling. Um, they are also responsible for referrals, like somebody that has a substance abuse issue, the occupational nurse um, can provide resources, okay? One of their big jobs is health promotion and risk reduction, right? They try their best to support positive lifestyle changes, right? Lower the risk for disease and injury of the employees, okay? Try and help create a sense of balance at work, right? Work, work balance, family balance, personal health. Um, and then they also need to be aware of legal and regulatory compliance. Okay, and that when we think of the workplace, who monitors our workplace? Who monitors our workplace? If there are problems, if there's an accident, if there's an unexpected death, if there's uh, several injuries, who, I know in your workplace, is who are you gonna get a visit from? Is it, OSHA? is it OSHA? OSHA, absolutely. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, okay? They are responsible for monitoring the laws and guidelines that have been placed on your workplace. Okay, whether it's HIPAA, whether it's uh, FMLA, Family Medical Leave Act, whether it's accidents, injuries, chemical spills. Okay, Occupy OSHA, OSHA plays a big part in that. You're gonna get a vi visit from OSHA if you're having issues. I mean, we all see in our workplaces, everybody know what an MSDS sheet is? You should. You want to know what it is? No. I, uh, Kaisha you know it and Kiana, can you turn your cameras on, please? Mackenzie, I can't see you. Leslie, I can't see you. Mackenzie went to the bathroom real quick. Oh. Okay, Kaisha, I need your camera on. Kiana, I need your Kiana, I need your camera on, please. Dikshaya, I can't see you. I'm looking at a ceiling. Thanks, Kiana, I appreciate it. <clears throat> okay, uh, worker, a worker place hazard detection. 
okay? We are responsible. If you're an occupational nurse, you're responsible for identifying hazards. Okay, think of the ad pie, all right? Go through the ad pie assessment, diagnosis. Think about it in terms of occupational health. Identify hazards, monitor, evaluate, analyze these hazards. Come up with a program, come up with an educational workshop that tries to help reduce exposure, reduce risk, right? They're also gas, gathering, what your gathering information about what your job description is, right? Trying to pull out part of your, what, might be at, what you might be at risk for in your, in your particular job. I mean, think about all the different workers in a hospital, all the way down from the administrators who are in office to the, the maintenance crew, to the nurses, to the food service, um, who else? Transpor uh, transportation or, you know, transporting patients. Think of all the different jobs, uh, jobs in a hospital. Well, your occupational department, occupational health department has to work with all those different job descri descriptions. Okay. Okay. Here's a great, here, here's the ad pie for occupational environmental nursing. Assessment. The nurse is, all, is always assessing the health status of the clients. Okay? She's always analyzing the assessment data to formulate diagnoses. She identifies specific outcomes to the clients, develops goals, comes up with a plan, implements her plan to get the desired outcomes and then evaluates it, okay? So one through six is your ad pie here. Okay, we already talked about um, he or she is the one who also manages the resources that support occupational health and safety programs. Okay, it requires uh, continued education. So she is responsible for her, her, his or her own professional development to make, maintain competency. Okay, and then you can read about collaboration, research and ethics. Okay. So let's go to our week six notes and see what we want to cover environmental health. Okay, so let's just review environmental health and occupational health in your notes. Okay, we already talked about how expensive environmental hazards are responsible for over one half of the total burden of disease in the world, over 80%. Okay, so some environmental health is determined by genetics, socioeconomic status and environmental exposures. So why would socioeconomic status influence environmental health? I'm asking. Anybody? Those who are, um, who have lower income might not be able to afford proper healthcare so and if that's a whole area like a whole environment that's low income then that whole environment's health might not be adequate yeah thanks celeste that's part of it yeah and what about the uh crowded living conditions living closer to hazardous sites let's say you live close to an airport or you live close to a big highway i mean i live I can almost see the traffic on I-70. It's a major thoroughfare going through Colorado that goes from east to west. All I hear all day is trucks and, you know, I'm sure the air pollution right in my area is pretty risky, okay? Um, poor quality choices for foods, having hazardous jobs, right? Living in older homes that may have lead-based paint living, you know, kids going to school in older schools. You know, older schools and day, old daycare facilities are very much at risk for lead, okay? 
So when we're, when we're assessing our environment, I mean, think about it. Think of all the risks we have. Think about your own environment where you live now. Think about all the risks that we have on a daily basis that we probably take for granted. I take for granted somebody's looking after the air pollution in my area. Um, I take for granted that the water I drink is safe and healthy. I take for granted that the where I live, the soil underneath me is free of hazardous chemicals, right? When I go to a restaurant or go pick up some takeout food, I make the assumption that everybody has properly washed their hands, prepared the food like they should be, right? Does anybody else take that for granted? I do, I do. And so there's lots of environmental health hazards in all of our communities, okay? So when we're doing environmental health, uh, health assessments, we need to find out where people live, where they work, where they go to school, right? Do they eat, do they eat a lot of fish? I mean, what, what, what's the issue with fish? Mercury, high levels of mercury. Right? So when you're, if you're the environment, you're, you're the community health nurse and you're doing an environmental assessment, let's just say of your community, right? You need to be able to do that windshield survey. That windshield survey, remember, is just driving around your community, looking out your windshield, making all these observations. Do people live near, is it, are there dump sites? Are there factories? Is it farming? Is it through transportation routes? Okay. I mean, we all, lead-based paint is an issue in homes built, they say before 1978. Okay, kids put paint chips in their mouth, right? They get exposed to lead, right? Exposure to lead for pregnant women could cause premature birth, learning disabilities, hypertension in as they become adults. And then the other environmental exposures are pesticides we use in our homes, right? Herbicides, pesticides, they're used in homes, schools, daycares, hospitals, lawn care. Okay. It's estimated that 30 million Americans drink water that does not meet the EPA's safe drink, drinking water standards. That's pretty scary, right? 50% of Americans live in areas where the air quality doesn't meet the national standards. Uh, cars, motor vehicles are the greatest single source of air pollution. Um, and then you have the burning of fossil fuels and then waste incineration, food contamination. What, are, what that can, can you hear that dog barking? Do I need to send my neighbor a text again? Can you guys hear that dog? No. Okay, let me know if you can. I need to send her a text. Her dogs just sit outside and bark all day. Um, food contamination, E. coli, salmonella. Okay. Um, what kind of risks do you guys have in you? What kind of environmental risks are in your environment? Where do you guys live? What are you close to? What are the risks? I'd like some participation. That'd be great. I would appreciate it. Celeste is the only one talking today. What are some environmental risks in the areas that you live in? Uh, I know, I, I know where I live. Um, I live a, around a lot of uh, like farmland, like okay. um, where they doing. Um, they are they constantly like um, certain seasons they do crop dusting as they call it. Yeah, yeah. And so I live around that, and and I know a couple of times they said that you know 
uh, they sent out a report every now and then about the water. Okay. So, you know, being that we live in, in such a high area of that, you know, that kind, that's kind of scary. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, has anybody ever seen the movie um, Aaron Brockovich? Yes. What's yes. Aaron Brockovich about? It's about um, the, the environmental, um, about uh, the, the stuff that they was doing and putting into, I think it was the water. Mm -hmm. And what happened? The water was contaminated. Yes. Right, and it was, I think it was a small town in Texas. Yes. A phenomenal movie, it was about an environmental disaster. Yeah. Water was contaminated and the population was getting sick. They were getting cancers. Kids were getting yeah. cancers. They were, it's terrible. They, that's, an, that's an example of an environmental. Yeah, they have a, a um, out right now, um, a lawsuit about the, uh, was it Camp Lejeune? No, oh, that's all and, you see on the television. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So all you see in the television is ads for water. I think was it. I think it was water contamination. There, yeah, right? it was. Yes, my husband um used to live in Camp Lejeune, wow. and um he he said the water was was bad. It was it was it was bad. Okay. Yeah. What other risks do you have in your environments? Thanks, Tamara. What other risks do you guys have in your environments that you live in? The, where I stay at, um, there's a landmine or mm. where they do like the dumping of the trash. Like a waste, waste yeah, site? Waste mm -hmm. Yeah, they had not had a couple of class actual lawsuits. Mm -hmm. Like people around there can't even sell their houses and stuff because won't nobody buy them. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else have particular hazards in the environment they live in? <laughs> okay, just want to see if there is a I thought there was a Maybe there isn't. Oh, here it is. Let's see what we cover. So we already know what occupational health is, right? It delivers health and safety programs to workers, right? Promotion, we've talked about this on promotion and restoration of health. Prevention of illness and injury, monitoring hazards in the workplace. We know that noise pollution is a common physical hazard leading to hearing loss. Okay, back pain is also a common complaint from lifting. So these are strategies that occupational health nurse has to come up with. Find out what the risks are and help, help your workers reduce the risk, right? Work sites have protective equipment available when any hazards exist. Okay, hearing protection for those loud, noisy plants, eye guards, right? And here's the roles we already talked about. Uh, the case management, the counseling, health promotion, legal regulatory, worker and workplace. Don't worry about education requirements. So let's just go through this for occupational and environmental health. Primary prevention, what are some examples? Teaching coping mechanisms, provide healthy diet education. Educating on the use of ergonomic lifting and protective equipment. So you were trying to prevent things before they happen, right? Secondary, maybe you're working in a large noisy plant. So maybe you screen for hearing loss. Blood pressure screening, screening for stress and burnout. Okay, everybody understand why those are primary and secondary? And then tertiary. Let's say somebody's been injured on the job. Maybe you're doing limited, uh, you've set up and organized or put together a limited duty program for workers that are recovering. Okay, provide education or 
training for a specific work, group of workers that have a disease, hypertension, carpal tunnel, diabetes. Okay. All right, let's cover, uh, let's go to communication. We're gonna to go to communication and the nurse patient relationship. We're gonna cover a couple of pages in, in chapter eight, and then we'll go to patient education and health promotion in chapter nine. Okay, I have the book pulled up. You guys can hear that dog. <laughs> All right, um, I am on page 115 in your fundamentals book. Okay, and I'm in the section that starts at nurse patient communication. Okay, trust and understanding are the keys to effective nurse, nurse patient education. Trust and understanding. Right. So when the nurse possesses, when we have our knowledge, our skills and our attitudes related to patient care, we're going to have a, we're going to have a successful nurse patient communication. We're going to have successful nurse patient communication. OK, so trust and understanding. And then we need to have the knowledge, the skills and the attitudes. Okay, so I need you to read this section. It's actually on your study guide. Um, is communicating with a hearing impaired patient. It goes through a couple of scenarios of <coughs> communicating with at-risk patients. The first one is the hearing impaired. Okay, if I don't know if anybody's ever communicated with a hearing impaired person, but there's certain interventions right here that you need to be practicing. Okay, so here's a list of some interventions, some techniques to help pr promote comprehension for hearing impaired people. So I do need you to review that. Then the other patient I need you to review is communicating with an aphasic patient. Okay, obviously aphasia means they have difficulty um, expressing and understanding, right? So they're gonna require specialized nursing interventions. Okay, and here's a list of helpful guidelines, techniques to work with an aphasic patient. Okay, so I need you to review those. And then the third is communicating with older adults. Okay, so older adults, we know it's from one, one end to the other, one end of the spectrum to the other. They vary in their communication abilities their interests and their capabilities, okay? So I want you to read this section. We know that um, it's important to obtain feedback from an older client. We need to make sure that the message has been heard and understood. And maybe it's even repeat back to you what the instructions were, okay? I'm sorry, there's one more, communicating with children. Okay, so you have the older adult, the child, the aphasic patient and the hearing impaired, right? Communicating with children, you have to be able to figure out where they are in the developmental stages of language and development and thought process, right? We know that young kids are very responsive to nonverbal messages. Okay, when interacting with an infant, keep the mother within the baby's view. So it gives you examples here. It, uh, it gives you examples of the infant. <clears throat> and you may get asked about this. Okay, school age child, just, I just need you to have a one liner. Just re read this little paragraph here. Okay. How do you communicate with an adolescent? How do you communicate with a school-aged child? 
How do you communicate with a toddler? <clears throat> and how do you communicate with an infant? What, what's the focus? So that's on page 117. Okay. Uh, so those are the, those, that's the part of um, communication that I need you to know out of chapter eight. <clears throat> okay, so let me go back to the notes here. We'll cover what we didn't cover that's in addition to those three pages. That is all education, okay? So that's all I need you to know. Now let's go to chapter nine. So kind of responsible for the whole chapter here, patient education and health promotion. All right, so why is patient education important? And how much time would you think that nurses spend with patient education? A lot? A lot. Patient education is, a, is foundational to our profession. Okay, so here's a few things we need to know. All right, so the purpose of education. Okay, what is the purpose? The ultimate purpose is the prevention of illness, promotion of wellness, and restoration of health. Okay, those are the three. The three ultimate goals, prevention of illness, promotion of wellness, and restoration of health. Patient education is one of the most important roles of a nurse. <clears throat> okay, there's three types of modes of learning. People learn in three ways, visually, seeing things, looking up at PowerPoints, looking up at screens, auditorial, auditory, auditory, which is obviously hearing. And then kinesthetic, which is the doing. Okay. So I need you to be aware of those three. Okay, then it goes through the nursing process of patient education. Obviously, the first part is assessment. We have to know what the patient needs are before we can develop our plan. Okay? Here's some factors that are affecting learning. One of the biggest issues in patient education is literacy. Okay, low literacy, okay. Are they ready to learn? Do they have different cultures and expectations? We have to be able to assess that as well. What does their culture say? What are their values and beliefs towards the education you're doing? Patient education plan on page 128. Okay, so what is a patient education plan? Think of ADPI. You need to analyze your, you've done your assessment, you need to analyze your assessment data. Then establish your goal, behavioral goals and objectives. I'm just talking through ADPI. Create a plan. For assisting the patient with whatever, whatever the goals and objectives are. Implement your plan and then be able to evaluate your plan. <clears throat> and when I say behavioral objectives, behavioral objectives, I have it here highlighted. Behavioral objectives indicate a desired change. All right, so a change to the current your current attitude or their current behaviors and attitudes towards their disease or their condition. That's what a behavioral objective is. 
And then it just goes through the nursing process, implementing, assessment, implementation, documentation. What's the rule on documentation? Not documented, not done. Right? When do we start discharge planning? At admissions. On admission. Okay. So some key points to take from this chapter. We know that we're continuously teaching patients about aspects of their disease, right? We know that patient education is a major part of patient care. We know that there are three methods of learning, visual, auditory, kinesthetic. First thing we need to know is what does the patient need? Okay, there, and this one, many factors can affect learning, physical limitations, situational factors, maybe pain, readiness to learn, personal values, cultures, and expectations. Okay, so read through, I want you to read through these key points. Okay, since we are responsible all of chapter nine. Okay, but I only... When I say that, I want you to go through what I've highlighted. So I don't know if you're following along, <clears throat> but I need you to go through what I've highlighted, not the entire chapter. Okay? So if you need to go back and watch the recording and see what's highlighted, that's what you're responsible for. Okay? So let's go to our notes and... No, that's the study guide. Okay. Education. Mm, we know what's one of the most important roles as a nurse. Our notes are kind of a summary of the reading, so I just want to make sure I've covered everything. Right? We know that when patients take personal responsibility for their health, they're much more effective at making change and maintaining that. Right? We hope <coughs> that education empowers, empowers the clients motivates them to take personal responsibility. Okay. Um, so we talked about visual learners, auditory learners, and kinesthetic learners. The one thing I also want you to remember is that there's three different domains of learning. So, uh, and, and they're all, we learn, we all learn in all these different ways, okay? So I do need you to know this. One is the cognitive. These are domains of learning. The cognitive, affective, and psychomotor. Have you heard that in any of your other classes? Yes. yes? No? Oh, you have? Okay. In uh, basic skills and fundamentals. Great, super. So the three cognitive, uh, the domains are cognitive, which is pretty simple, thinking. Thinking, you hear information, you process it. Affective is the feeling. Okay, what are your attitudes, beliefs? And then psychomotor is learning a skill through actually doing it, right? It's easier, the example we give is it's much easier for a patient to learn how to use a glucometer if they're a newly diagnosed diabetic by actually practicing with a glucometer, okay? So all three of these domains need to be considered. You know, what if you're teaching a large group and some, some are cognitive learners, some are affective learners, some are psychomotor learners. You have to be able to figure out how you're gonna meet the needs of all of them. You might want to so, when we're doing our patient education, again, we go through the nursing process here. So here's your assessment. Put yourself on your here's your plan, All right? So you've done your assessment. Now you're gonna develop your plan. What sort of goals, what sort of objectives? Okay, maybe you're changing addressing. Okay.
Okay, and with the, here's your behavioral goals. Represent the desire change. Desire change, patient will change the wound dressing. Patient will check blood glucose with the glu glucometer three times a day. Patient will adopt a low sodium diet. Those are the goals and objectives that are created from the assessment data. And then how do we intervene? How do we create an environment that is conducive to learning? Okay, lots of, lots of ways to create an environment conducive to learning. And you could read through those if you already haven't. Okay. So what if the patient isn't ready or willing to learn? Have you worked with any patients in your work environment that have not been ready or willing to learn? And if so, what have you done? Anybody? Has anybody worked with a patient that's really not ready to learn or doesn't want to learn or kind of blowing you off? What do you guys do? You're going to come up. This is going to come up in nursing, so we need you got to you need to know your strategies. What do you do? I would I would come back back um, at uh, a later time. Okay. Because a lot of times when you go in, um, and if and if it's somebody that receives some you know bad news, they it takes a while for them to process of what's going on. So a lot of times, you know, I would just um, say, well, I'll come back um, at a later time um, to speak with you about um, the situation. And then, we, you know, instead of just saying, well, well, I only got this time available. You go, you're going to have to do it now. Mm -hmm. um, just do it on their time. Okay. That's good. The other thing we need, in addition to what Tamara said, um, What's the most important thing we need to do at the beginning of a nurse patient relationship? What do we need to develop? Trust, because that's how they'll be able to have the willingness to even want to learn or listen to what yeah, you have to exactly. say. Exactly. Excellent. Who said that? Celeste. Celeste. That's excellent. That's exactly right. They're much more likely to listen and take your advice if you have a trusting relationship. Right, they're much more likely to be motivated. Okay, what happens if the culture? What happens if cultural beliefs are different from their treatment plan? We know that cultural issues such as diet, lifestyle, communication, health-related behavior are all going to affect their treatment plan. And what we try and do is try and use as many of their cultural preferences as we can in their plan, right? And then how do we do evaluation? Okay, actually evaluation should be starting at the beginning as well. It's, it's an ongoing process all through your ad pie. Teach back method. You know, if you're teaching a family about wound care and the family's going to start to do the wound care, ask them to tell you what they learned in their own words. Have them show you how to do it. Ask for a return demonstration. Okay. Document. And then uh, prevention and education. I'm going to have you guys read those. Primary, secondary, tertiary. Okay, there's some examples about nursing education or patient education. Okay, so I'd like for you to read those to get more experience with being able to identify primary, secondary, tertiary. Okay, so that's patient education. Does anybody have any questions?
Okay, um, let's um, let's pull up our quiz. Quiz four. I'm trying to get it. Hang on. There we go. What's wrong with my Zoom? What am I trying to get to here? Okay, everybody have quiz four pulled up? Here, let's do it together. Anybody do it beforehand? All right. All right, question one, which statement is true regarding children and environmental health hazards? Is it B, their proximity? This, what do you guys I think? think? I think it's B. B? Yeah. What do their you guys proximity? think? Anybody else have a different answer? We know D is not right. Mm -hmm. They are protected by water consumption of about body pain. They're younger. Living. We know that A is, a is correct, not. right? Yeah, I, I'm going to go with B. I think it's B. B? Yes. What about C? They are protected by lower consumption of food and water by body weight. I don't think they would be protected if you yeah. have lower consumption. Because if you're, yeah. I'm going to go with B. Should we go with B? Yeah. Okay. Okay, next question two. During the home health visit for a pregnant client, the nurse notes the husband regularly uses pesticides at work. Which nursing intervention is a priority? I'm gonna go with A. I'm gonna go with A too. Okay. What do you guys think about A? We all in agreement with A? I think. What? All right, let's do A. Number three, home health nurse works in a community with high rates of complex chronic illnesses and neurological disorders. Which environmental characteristic is a priority. Why is B wrong? Because isn't it homes that were built before 1978? Yeah. Okay. Presence of near the community. Why is D wrong? Because they're using filters, so that would be good. Yep. So, what so we've see? eliminated B and D. Okay, we're going to say C. Yeah, I feel like it's C too. Oh, you guys have a group going there? In class. We, well, we in the class already. Good. That's great. Okay. 
So we know that there's a high rate of illnesses, neurological disorders. So what do we need to protect them from? C, right? Number four, the nurses reinforcing education about the diabetic diet. Which statement indicates a barrier to learning? So remember, this is a negatively asked question, right? So you're asking, what is a barrier? Would it be B? I think I would rather use keto diet instead of this. <laughs> well, we know that A's, A's, I think it's A's, D. B? Okay. D. D or B? D as in dog. Oh, D. Okay. Why, why do you think that's the correct answer? Because you're trying to educate them about a diabetic diet, but it kind of seems like they're resistant and they would rather mm -hmm. use something else. Is a keto diet healthy for a diabetic patient? Isn't that, isn't that protein, like more protein? Keto diet? Carbs. Yeah, okay, yeah, carbs. So no, because carbs are sugars. Correct. D. And you know what? A lot of my other students say B. B might be correct because if somebody's saying, I'm familiar with the medical terminology, how do we know that's accurate? How do we know they're just not saying that? Right? Okay, question five. Which nursing intervention will enhance the learning for a client who speaks English as a second language? Create a pamphlet. B. Do we agree with that? <coughs> and it doesn't look like there's an, an interpreter around, right? So how are we gonna do C? D's not, D's not right. Okay, so, and then A, you're gonna do a recording, but English is their second language, so they're not gonna understand it. Mm -hmm. Right? So B. Question six, home health nurses reinforcing education on the use of a glucometer. Which approach would be most effective? There's that priority word, most. Some of the answers, all the answers might look right, but it's asking what's the most. Would it be A, a. demonstrate the use and then have them demonstrate as well? Everybody in agreement with that? Mm -hmm. You could yeah. also provide a pamphlet describing the functions. B, you could do B. You could do C. You could do D. And that's a good example of all the, so if you were to read that and all the answers look correct, go back and read the question because it was asking for what is the most effective. Okay, good job. Seven, the home health nurse is reinforcing education for an eight-year-old client with type one diabetes. Which approach will be most effective? Obviously we know B, that's not correct, right? Why do we have to just teach the parents rather than the child? Eight-year-olds can learn, right? 
uh, maybe eight-year-olds can't read great, so why would we be giving them written right. pamphlets? Yeah, I would say A. Yep. Yep. Question eight, which nursing intervention is a priority for a client who's not motivated to learn? C. Is it is it D? Or D? Yeah, wait. Establish trust report prior to Yeah, I think it's D because priority. Yeah. What did we say was the right. most important thing that Yeah. I'll say D too. Okay. okay. Occupational health nurses care for a client who reports lower back pain that is worse at the end of each workday. Which nursing intervention is a priority? Another important word, priority. I would say B. B is in boy? Yes. Sonia? B is in boy? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Right, so before we wanna do a referral or before we're not really the ones to recommend pharmacological treatment anyway, right? And massage therapists, I mean, that's not our, that's not our scope to recommend that. We would, if, it, if they say they're sore at the end of every day, we would observe them, right? Let's look at how they're lifting. Let's, let's look at their body mechanics. So correct, good job. Which statement is true reg regarding the scheduling of client education? Oh, she didn't make one. He and my mother. Is it B? Yep. Do we agree with B? It's not up to us B. to do it when it's convenient for us, right? We have to think about our clients. And and depending on our the depending on our population who we're teaching, it may not be able to be done in one long comprehensive session. Maybe it has to be split out into smaller chunks. And D doesn't make sense. So, okay. So score yourselves. How'd you do? How do we do as a group? Do we miss any? Nope. Ten out of ten. Great. I like doing it during class so you guys can all get 10s and we can talk through each of them. Okay, let's do our attestation real quick. Okay. Again, sorry about that, but question one and four are the same. So, uh, so you attended class today, 1111 with me. We did not talk about the four stages of a needs assessment. Let me go back to our notes. I want you guys to start talking out loud and answering question three. We talked about these, the three different ways to learn. Not the domains, not cognitive effect of psychomotor. What are the three ways to learn? Uh, visual, okay. auditory, and kind of steady. Yeah. You guys work on those.
What do you think our four stages of a needs assessment are? Anybody found that in your readings? Let's go back and find it. There's your three ways of learning, your visual, auditory and kinesthetic. Okay, so here are our needs. One of them right here is readiness to learn. We need to be able to assess our cultural values and expectations or their cultural values and expectations. And then we need to be able to assess their confidence and ability. Oh, I'll never be able to do that. Or, oh, I, I'm not smart enough to learn that. Are you showing your screen? Because it's not showing up. Oh. Well, it says I'm sharing. Let's see, let's try again. Can you see that now? Yeah, we can see it now. Okay, so I'm in the assessment part of chapter nine. Okay. And I'm in factors that affect learning. Okay, so doing our needs assessment. Here's your readiness to learn, your cultural values and expectations, or their cultural values and expectations their confidence and ability to learn. Okay, I'm on page 126. Okay. I'm only seeing three. So let's leave it at that. I'm only seeing three. Okay. I think I remember this from last term. I was supposed to change that from four to three. Okay. And you did you already fill out the fourth one? Or the third one, sorry. The three ways of learning. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, the only other thing I want to cover with you guys is just to have a look at the... Um, study guide. All right. For those of you that haven't looked at it, I've, I've broken it out pretty, <clears throat> pretty specifically for you. Okay. We know this is weeks four, five, and six. I've already re, uh, rehashed for you the concepts that we covered. Okay. So this is all right from your module, your syllabus. <clears throat> so these were the con, <clears throat> pardon me, Concepts we covered in week four. <coughs> concepts in week five. Concepts in week six. And all those are addressed in the study guide. I've also given you the readings from week four, week five, and week six. Do not forget, uh, or don't forget, most of these chapters are only certain pages of the chapter. There's a few, there's a full chapter. 
So be mindful of that. If it's just pages, like for this week, chapter eight and nine, nine was the whole chapter, but eight was only four pages. Okay, so you're not responsible for the entire chapter eight. Okay. Um, and then it goes through what you need to know. Okay, so remember the study guide was put together from um, your notes that you get every week, the readings, um, also looking at what's covered on the exam. Okay, so all the different concepts above should have a section in here. And what I'd like for you to do is read through each section, read through the bullet points in each section, and try and assess what information are we giving you and what kind of question could that translate into, right? So for example, vulnerable populations, let's read what's in here. Whole bunch of information. Vulnerable populations have poor health outcomes compared to people in terms of morbidity and mortality. That's something you could be asked about. Okay, what, what, let's see, what, what, um, vulnerable populations have poor health outcomes due to what? What's the answer? Due to what? Morbidity and mortality. Or what's, what affects it? <clears throat> okay. Vulnerable populations also have a high prevalence of chronic diseases, such as hypertension, high levels of communicable diseases, TB, hepatitis, STD, upper respiratory tract infections. So what do you gather from that? Vulnerable populations have a higher incidence prevalence of chronic illnesses. Of what kind of chronic illnesses? Select all that apply. Okay. Another part of this question. They all, vulnerable populations also have higher, mort or higher mortality rates than the general population. Why? Because of poor living conditions, diet, health status, crime violence. Okay, so this three, if you break that down, you break that bullet down, there's three, there's three different pieces of information in there. Does that make sense? So as you read through all these sections, read through each bullet and think, hmm, what information are they giving? And what might be a question asked about it? Priority question, select all that apply. Remember, one of the most common mistakes I, I get with students is they, they've missed a word or a phrase in the question. We just had several priority questions at our quiz. What's the most important? What's the priority? You know, if all the answers look like the right answer, then you gotta go back and read the question. You missed something, okay? So there's a section on pregnant adolescence, which was one of our concepts covered above. And then we covered mental illness, anxiety, eating disorders. Okay, so high risk for homelessness, substance abuse, victim perpetrator, victim or per, and or perpetrator of crime. Who's at risk? Mentally ill, mood, people with mood disorders, anxiety. You need to know what is general anxiety disorder. Okay, you need to know people with phobias. This talks about OCD, PTSD, and bipolar. So those are the ones we want you to know about. Okay. Substance abuse. What do we want you to know about substance abuse? Alcoholism, here's what we need you to know right in here. 
What do we want you to know about energy, energy drinks? So what should you know? How does tobacco affect people? E-cigarettes. You know, the e-cigarettes, the biggest risk is the oil that's poisonous to kids. And then cocaine and meth, amphetamines and amphetamines. We know these are stimulants. And we know that abuse of these causes cardio cardiovascular complications. Like what? Right here, but high body temp, high heart rate, high blood pressure. Okay. What is our priorities with death and dying? Pain control, right, is our top priority. But also priorities providing comfort. Okay, but here it states pain control is the priority. So if you're asked a question about the dying patient, it says, what kinds of interventions do we provide for the dying patient? Well, we try and provide them dignity. We try and provide them autonomy. We try and provide, control their GI or respiratory distress. But what if the question said, and pain control is another answer. But what if the question says, what is the priority? What's the answer? Pain control. Right. You guys, if you don't can't articulate this, go back and review the differences between religiosity and spirituality. Okay, remember, religiosity is dealing with one specific religion. So your the congregation you belong to, whether it's a church, a mosque, a temple, that's that that's religiosity. You're dealing with one religion. Where spirituality, you're looking at the big picture. What is your what is your thinking around spirituality. Okay, ethics, know your ethics. This is highlighted from my review this morning. Okay, know your ethical principles and your ethical theories. They're all right here. Have a look at those. And then we covered environmental health and education. There's your, one of the most important learner related barriers is low literacy. And here's your section on a aphasic client, a hearing impaired client, which we went through today. Okay. Occupational health we went through today, cultural competence and cultural diversity. And then growth and development specifically the younger kids, seven to 12, and then the adolescents. Okay. So there's your study guide in a nutshell. <clears throat> uh, if you can't get to <clears throat> Professor Kershaw's review on Sunday, at least watch my recording, you have it. Okay. How are you guys coming in your HESI study guide, HESI prep assignment? There's a whole another section that can be filled out after today. Your environmental and occupational health section, right? Hope you guys are working on that. Okay, <clears throat> I'm gonna, we're, we're done and you've got a half an hour. Maybe go to your HESI, HESI prep guide, fill it out for at least today, or if you haven't started, you know, get going. Take the next 30 minutes to go be filling that out. Or take the next 30 minutes to start watching my recording for your exam. Okay. Professor Marvel, mm -hmm. are you guys gonna provide like those Quizlets and um, Kahoots this time too? Um, I don't know if Professor, Professor Kershaw has done the, I'll ask them. I know that uh, Professor Ford did some Quizlets and were they helpful to you guys? Oh, yes, very. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll shoot a text off to both of them <coughs> right now. Um, 
Thank you for that suggestion. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any questions? Make sure your name is in the chat. Um, I will stay on if anybody has any questions. I hope that everybody 